can be seated. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes, good morning. So I'll just be honest. For those of you that don't know me, my name is, is Pastor Chris. I'm a, it's not Pastor, the surname Chris. It's just Chris. You can call me Chris. But um, I'll just be honest with you and let you know that, that, that our team, I'm so proud of our team for handling, putting out extra chairs. But we're also, we're in a good way. We're totally shocked and amazed that all of you guys are here. And so this is just an incredible thing for us. Um, I know for me and our staff and our team, uh, we're just so thankful that you chose to spend the day with us. It means a lot. It really, really does mean a lot. So we are, at South Point Church, we're a church to call home and a family to call your own. That's kind of our, our tagline. Like if you're standing in line at Clicks and you know if you're at Clicks, you're going to be in line and you turn around and someone says, hey, what's, what's the deal with South Point? This is, this is really it. We're a church to call home, a family to call your own. We're a friendly church that hopes to inspire you to seek Jesus. So we're, we're friendly. I always say in the service with saying we're a friendly church. Let's have tea and coffee together because we're friendly. I want to let you guys know before I start my sermon that we have no service on January the 1st. So the building will be closed. No services. So we want to give our team and our staff and our volunteers just a Sunday off. So there'll be no service on the 1st of January. But on Sunday, the 8th of January at 9 a.m., we will be back to our regular services. All of our kids' environments are open. So we'll be back in full force. Now... For those of you that have one of these cards on your seat, this is kind of what we call a value card. And if you've never seen it, then you can pick it up and look at it. And on one side here, it talks about tithing. Now, what I understand about Christmas Day is that if Christmas Day falls on a Sunday and you tithe on a Sunday, it counts double for you in heaven. So <laughs> I'm just putting that out there, you know, just so, no, I'm I'm kidding, just to let you know. But that's how you do give. If you want to give your tithe to us, that, that's, there's uh, the different ways that you can do that there on the card. And then on the other side, you can tell us how we can pray for you. We're a church that believes in prayer. We're a praying church. So you can fill out prayer requests there. And then we've got a thing that will be coming up in January called Next. And this is a great place where we, in an authentic and transparent way, can say, this is who we are as South Point Church. And really, it equips you to make a decision of, hey, this may be a church I want to be a part of. Or, hey, this is, isn't a church I want to be a part of, which is also okay, because we'll help you find that special spot for you. And then community. We're going to launch a huge kind of community group initiative in February. And so if you're looking for a community to just surround yourself with, then that's coming in February. And you can fill that out and drop it in the, the give box at the door or at the info table outside. And then last thing before I start the message is our WhatsApp number. If you send us a WhatsApp to this number, you can drop a prayer request. You can do uh, let us know how you're doing. You can drop a praise report if you need help. This is essentially the church's number. Um, also, if you want to be added to our WhatsApp list, then we send out you know, a kind of a preview of the Sunday service or we give important announcements or updates. And we've just found that WhatsApp's the easiest way to communicate with you. So, so that's it for the announcements. Now, I'm so excited to get into what we're going to talk about today. It's a Christmas service. And for me, as, a, as the, the pastor of the church, it's always like, what do we want to talk about on Christmas? You know, because the easy thing is we'll talk about, okay, well, Jesus, you know, he came and he was born in a manger. And we've all seen, you know, the movies about that. And, and, and that's, you know, kind of what Christmas is for. But when I think about what to talk about, I, I just want, you know, I think about you. I think about the people that haven't been to church in a while or the people that are new or maybe you're visiting family. And so what I hope to do with today is inspire something in you, inspire something new, inspire a new feeling in you and let you kind of walk away from today's service, walk away from Christmas with maybe a different kind of appreciation or even a different kind of way that you think about it or way that you look at it. Even if you're just inspired to go throughout your day today thinking about Christmas a little bit differently. And so what I want to do is I want to start with this word, wonder. So a lot of wonder happened this morning. So I know we've got kids in the service this morning. Kids, who got to open Christmas presents this morning? Yeah, get, if, you, if you open Christmas presents, give a big shout. Yeah. I'm sure last night and this morning there was a lot of wonder about what was going to be under the Christmas tree or what presents you were going to have. You know, but there's also a lot of wonder that we have as adults when we think about our life or we think about this season of Christmas. I wonder what it's going to be like at Christmas time. We just finished a move. We moved our entire house in three days. 
And I spent the last week wondering if we were going to live through it. <laughs> and we have. At midnight on Thursday night, the Christmas, my wife set up the Christmas tree because the Ladd family was going to be ready. See, the, the, this idea of wonder, it's, it's this idea of you're thinking about how's this going to be? What's going to be there? How is this going to impact me? Another word that you could put with it is the word awe. Kind of like awe and wonder. It's like you're, it's something that you're taken aback with. So what's going on in your life? This is the part where you interact with me. And I want you to think about your life and think about the things like what is it that you wonder about? Do you have a wonder about anything at all? See, what I'd like to challenge you to do and ask you to do as we think about and talk about the Christmas story today is I want you to look at it through the eyes of wonder. I want you to look at it through the eyes of, of wonder and awe. What is this that's happening? What is this day that we celebrate? What is it that Jesus really came and did? And so to paint that picture, to get a big and better, more complete picture of it, we're going to look at some of the main characters. Okay, We're going to look at the main characters in this story. And, I, and as I call it a story, here at church, we believe that this is not a story. It's a factual event. But it's just easier for my brain to reference it as a story. But this is a real thing that happened. So I want to talk about Mary. Mary. Who was Mary? What, what was Mary? See, Mary is somebody uh, that, that we all know. We all know about Mary, the mother of Jesus. But some things about Mary maybe that you didn't know is Mary well, it was a first century Jewish woman from Nazareth. And what that meant as a Jewish woman, uh, what that meant is that Mary would have been about 12 or 13 years old when she was at a marriageable age. So, any girls in here that are 12 or 13 years old, imagine you're getting ready to get married. That'd be kind of crazy, right? Or how about this? How about how many dads of girls that are 12 and 13 years old <laughs> thinking about oh, my 12 and 13 year old baby is going to be given away in marriage? See, what happened in, in this Jewish culture, in this, this religion, is, is that a 12 or 13-year-old, they would be ready. Actually, it was 12 years old and 6 months. But around that time, they would be ready to be given away in marriage. And these were like arranged marriages. So Mary, as a young girl, as a young woman, would be told, this is going to be your husband. We're going to give you away to this person. I wonder what Mary thought about her life. So imagine, Mary's not encountered the angels. She's not encountered anything. She doesn't know anything about Jesus. She's a 13, maybe 14-year-old girl. The Bible doesn't tell us her exact age. But culturally, we can pinpoint it down somewhere between 12 and maybe 15. But she's a, young, she's a girl. She's wondering about what life has to offer her. She's wondering about who she's going to be paired with, who, what, what arranged marriage is going to be given to her. She's wondering about, am I going to be able to have kids? Am I going to be a good wife? What are the expectations of me? And you know what? There's probably also some, some innocence that she's wondering about. Like, I wonder what Mary's favorite thing to play, uh, her favorite toy was. What was her favorite thing to imagine? What was her favorite color? What was her outlook on this life as a young woman? Her outlook was, was something that was probably filled with awe and wonder. What is my life going to look like? Now, as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, as a marriageable woman, Mary would have been this word here. She would have been betrothed. Now, betrothed. This is the magic for smiley betrothed. <laughs> here we go. The world's best magician. Mary would have been betrothed. Now, what this means is this means that she would have been promised for, reserved for in marriage. And so as in the Jewish culture, there were two stages to marriage. All right, the, 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 this is, I'm so glad that we didn't have to go through this. There were two stages. Stage number one is that Mary would be betrothed to, and in her situation, to a guy named Joseph. But Mary would be betrothed. And what that meant is she would be set aside and promised to him. Now, they didn't live together. She would still be living with her parents or with her family because she was young. So the betrothal process would be one year or maybe two years long before Mary would actually have been taken into her husband's home, which would have been the second stage. 
Now, the purpose of this betrothal period is it lets Mary, it lets the woman get to know this husband that she has been arranged with. Now, legally, she's married. Legally, she's, she is married. It's done. It's signed. It's done. She has the legal rights as a wife, okay? And, and her husband has the legal rights as a husband, so legally, she is this. But I think it's quite interesting that the Jewish faith left it in there that, that this betrothal period was a year, maybe two years long, so that Mary could get to know her chosen husband or her assigned husband, and so that they could prepare to get their lives together. Now, the second part to marriage, kind of the, the ending, what, what really sealed the deal on this marriage, is that, that the husband would then go to Mary's house and take her and bring her into his house. And this would be the completion of that process. So here we have Mary. She has been betrothed to, to a man. This marriage has been arranged. And I, and I wonder again, I go back to this idea of wonder, what was it that Mary thought about that? Am I going to be a good wife? How many women in here, uh, as you were getting ready to get married, thought, am I going to be a good wife? Am I going to be able to, to provide you know, the love, the care that my husband needs? Am I going to be able to take care of kids? Am I going to be able to be a mother? Am I even capable of being a mother? There's all this wonder. There's all this thought that this real human being named Mary had. She saw her life going down a certain trajectory. And it was one filled with wonder about what God is going to do. It actually didn't even have a lot to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with him yet. But it was her as a Jewish woman, what she was going to be as a wife. And now that brings in the second character in this story that I want to look at. And that's the guy named Joseph. Now I thought it was very awesome that Roger paid tribute to Joseph by singing, you know, Joseph's song. But Joseph, let's talk about what he's wondering about. What he's in awe and wonder of. Joseph was a, was a man who had been given a wife named Mary. You know, I wonder what Joseph was thinking. Was he thinking, you know, man, I hope I can provide. I hope I can be a good husband. I, I hope that, that we can have a good marriage. We can have a good family. See, we, we often forget that these people, before Jesus, before Jesus interrupted their world, they had values. They had favorite things. They had favorite meals. They had time that they liked to spend together. They were normal. They had a normal life, kind of like you and I do. They, they had their culture, their customs. And Joseph is probably looking at his life as it starts to fit within the customs of the Jewish times and saying, hey, this is pretty good. My life is coming along pretty well. I'm actually quite happy with how this is happening. You know, we, we can look at our lives that way. I remember being, you know, 20-something years old and, and my friends, you know, having big jobs and making big money and having cars and me thinking my life is not reflecting their lives. Something is off here. I, I am not keeping up with the trajectory of, of what, you know, would be normal for life. My friends are buying houses and stuff, and I'm busy quitting my job to move to South Africa to become a missionary. And I wonder what Joseph was, was thinking. See, Joseph, he was so, I, I would like to imagine he was so happy that what, what Jewish culture would dictate was happening in his life. It was like, it's happening. It's real. I'm going to have a wife who's going to give me a son who's going to carry on my name, who's going to carry on the tradition of our family. And so now I want to introduce a third character into this story. This, is, this character is an angel, an angel named Gabriel. Now, th this is where the story takes a twist and, and a turn for us. This is where all the wonder that Mary carried, you know, wondering about her marriage and her life and wondering about being a wife. This is where the wonder that Joseph had about wondering about being a husband. Am I a good husband, a bad husband? How's this going to work out? How am I going to be? What's our family going to be like? How's this, you know, all the, am I going to like my mother-in-law? Am I going to, we going to get along? You know, what if she wants to spend the night at our house? I don't know if I'm into that. It's where all these people had all this wonder about life and what it was going to be. And it was perfectly in line with what Jewish custom would have dictated. And they were super happy about that. And then this, this dude Gabriel shows up. An angel sent by God. Now I like to even give, give Gabriel, and this is me just completely speculating. This is not in the Bible anywhere. 
But I like to imagine that God looks at Gabriel and he says, Gabriel, this is what I want you to go do. I want you to go mess up Mary's world. Then I want you to go mess up Joseph's world. And then the Savior's going to come from that. And Gabriel wonders, God, why? What is happening here? Why is this going on? Now, again, that's not biblical. That's not in the Bible. That's just the way that I like to think about Gabriel. But what happens is, is that God gives Gabriel a purpose. And he gives Gabriel a message. And Gabriel, as an angel, he doesn't have the freedom to wonder, should I do this, should I not do this? He just is there to obey God and do what God says. And so Gabriel has two interactions. The first interaction that he has is with Mary. And so let's look at what happens here. So Mary, who's betrothed, okay? Mary is set aside for marriage with Joseph. Mary is also a virgin. This is extremely important. Part of the betrothal process was it was a period of time where the bride, where Mary, would be tested to make sure that she stayed faithful and committed to her husband, meaning that she would remain a virgin. This is key. This is key not only to Christianity, but the virginity thing is key also to this Jewish culture, to this betrothal process. And so Mary has an encounter with Gabriel. Gabriel shows up to Mary. Shows up. Out of nowhere, Mary, she was greatly troubled at his words. I would be too if an angel just showed up and looked at me. I would think I've taken the wrong medication. Something's gone completely (laughs) off and wrong here. I'm exhausted. I knew that we shouldn't have done, you know. So Mary has this angel show up. It terrifies her. And she's troubled by the things that he's telling her. And she wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? Is Gabriel here to give me good news? Is Gabriel here to give me bad news? What is this encounter going to be? Mary is wondering. She's in awe of what's happening. And so then if we read on here, Gabriel starts to talk to her. This is where Gabriel really messes up her world. So Gabriel looks at Mary, the innocent 12 to 15 year old young woman who's got nothing but wonder about the life that she has to come. And he says that, that you can go on to verse 30 here. And in the next verse it says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Okay, so Mary, as a Jewish uh, woman, would have, would have received that well. She would have been like, Okay, I believe in God. I found favor with God. This is great. Good news. I'll let my guard down. I'll drop the knife. I'll relax. Okay, so you found favor with God. And then in verse 31, the angel kind of throws her off a little bit and says, You will conceive... And give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. So he's like, you're, you're going to give birth to a son and be called Jesus. Now, something interesting about the name Jesus is the most common name that was used in that day was Yeshua. And Yeshua kind of was a derivative of Joshua. And what it was is that people were naming their kids Yeshua because everyone was kind of in anticipation of the Christ coming back, of the return of, of, of Christ. And so, because every parent's kind of playing the lottery, wondering if their child is going to be the one, they thought, well, we better just go ahead and name him Yeshua just in case. That way we don't have to do a name change later. So that was one of the most popular names. So she's told, you're going to name him Jesus. And then the angel goes on to tell her, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Again, another fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus will come from the line of the lineage of David. David was one of the great kings of Israel. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So again, this is fulfilling prophecy. That he will reign, his kingdom will never end. So Mary is receiving all of this. And I would say that she's rightfully so, she's perplexed. Because how, she's gonna con- how is she going to conceive as a virgin? And she's betrothed meaning that she can't not be a virgin because she's got this Joseph thing that she's got to, you know, in a year or so, kind of like be faithful to. And so she asked the angel. I love this. She just asked him outright. Hey, I don't know if you understand. You're an angel. I'm a human. Our biology is probably a little bit different. There's a certain way things happen here on earth. And I'm not sure how this is all going to come about. And she says, how will this be? So Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin... How will this be? The angel then answered her, 
The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So Mary's world is completely changed. I want you to remember, Mary was a young woman full of awe and wonder. She just had a visit from an angel that told her that she would have an immaculate conception, that the Holy Spirit would help her conceive what would become the Savior of the world. Mary is told on this night that she will give birth to the Savior of the world that we sit here this morning and we celebrate. That's just got to be mind-blowing. See, after she hears this, this angel, and God gives her some more, you know, some things to confirm it. She says, hey, your sister Elizabeth is also going to be pregnant. And she goes and she spends three months with Elizabeth, kind of telling her, hey, you're going to fall pregnant. And she does. And, and everything's kind of confirmed and everything's great. Mary's like, man, this is amazing. Meanwhile, let's remember poor Joseph here. So Joseph, he finds out that Mary is pregnant. So let's look at what happens with Joseph here in Matthew. Matthew 1.18, kind of give you a bit of backstory. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, so there's the, the betrothal period. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, don't, 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 don't go on smiley, leave it here, don't spoil anything on the next verse here. See, what, what Joseph had is Joseph had the ability that, that, and it says it in Deuteronomy, that if he found a reason for a wife to be unfit in this betrothal period, he could give her basically a certified letter of divorce. So Joseph had the right within this betrothal period to say, hey, you started out great, but now for whatever reason I want, whatever reason I can think of, if I just decide that you're not marriage material for me, then I can cancel this agreement. And I, I, can, I can give you a certificate of divorce. And what that would have done is it would have just plagued Mary. It would have put a, a rejected stamp on her. She would have been unable to marry again. It, was, it would have been horrible for her in society. It would have been horrible for her financially. It would have been horrible. So Joseph has the opportunity. My wife betrothed to me, is pregnant. Now, which one of my friends has been to her house last? <laughs> now, so Joseph, he has this opportunity presented to him. And so now, Smiley, you can go on in verse 20, in verse 19. But Joseph, her husband, he was faithful to the law, meaning he was going to divorce her because he was faithful to the law. And yet, he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph is going to do this in an honorable way. He's going to divorce Mary, but not in a disgraceful way. And so now, what happens next is, after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. See, the angel appeared to Mary in person, and appeared to Joseph in a dream. Maybe it's because Mary was more brave. Maybe it's because Joseph just needed to be settled, his mind to be settled down. Joseph, as the man, is trying to figure out what to do in this situation. So God just puts him to sleep. There's no distractions. And he drops this message in Joseph's dream. And so Joseph, he has this dream. And in the dream, the angel Gabriel, he says to him, Joseph, son of David. See, Joseph was son of David. Jesus is going to come from David's lineage. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't stress, man. This is still the person that you're supposed to marry. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So this angel's like, it's not your best mate. It's not your friend. This didn't happen at a bride. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit here. Take a deep breath and relax. And so then the angel goes on to tell, to tell Joseph, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And then we read this prophecy here. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home 
as his wife. See, what Joseph did in that moment is he completed the marriage. When he took Mary home as his wife, it completed the marriage. Step two was done. Joseph didn't do what society said he could do. Joseph listened to what this angel told him to do. So Joseph, he finishes the marriage, takes her home. But then it says, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph became the father of Jesus Christ. Now, the last person that I want to talk about as we kind of wrap up this story here is a guy named John. Now, John is one of the disciples, and John is, is, it was actually one of Jesus' favorite chosen disciples. In fact, when, John was, uh, when Jesus was on the cross and he was looking down and he saw his mother Mary there, John was also there, and, and Jesus told John, please take care of my mom. Please take care of her in her old age. And it's speculated, again, this speculation, that because of that, John would have even oversaw the funeral and the, the, the death of Mary. And so we fast forward 60, 70 years later. We find this man named John, one of Jesus' disciples. John was the last of the disciples to be alive. So there were 12 disciples. 11 of them are dead. John, the 12th, he's the last one alive. He's seen everything happen. And John is this powerful movement of the gospel. He's this powerful movement that's just telling people about Jesus, just left and right. And John has got so much just kind of momentum behind him that the emperor and, and actually the Jewish people are, are kind of upset with the fact that John keeps talking about this Jesus guy because they want it to go away. And so what they do is they take him to the emperor in Rome. And this emperor is kind of told like, hey, this guy's going to divide the kingdom. He's creating a problem for us. And so what the emperor does, the emperor says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to torture him and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. Because if we kill John, the movement dies. Now, did you know that one of the things the emperor did is took a cauldron of boiling oil and put John in it? And then not only did they put John in a cauldron of boiling oil, he made John drink poison. So it wasn't like he, he just killed him, he tried to fry him. They didn't have an air fryer at the time. They just had this cauldron of oil. And guess what happened? John stood right up. And he walked out of it without a burn. Not a blemish on his skin. Not a thing happened to him with the poisoning. He was completely protected by God. So the emperor looks at him and says, okay, we, we can't get rid of him. Obviously, God is protecting him. And when now that it, word has gotten out that John has survived this event, if we, if we kill him, if he becomes a martyr, there's going to be a huge uprising of people. So we can't do that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to exile John. We're going to put him on an island, an island called Patmos. And this is a rocky island, it's windy, it's not very, very happy, it's not, a, it's not like an island vacation place. But, but on this island, John sat to rot and die. Now it's in this moment that I like to think about John wondering, was this worth it? Will people remember what Jesus did? Will people remember my writings? See, John wrote part of the New Testament, but at the time it wasn't the New Testament. These were just writings and letters and thoughts and recordings that John had and he put down on paper and he dictated a lot of it to somebody to write for him. And, and John is wondering, will they make it? Will it work? Will this Christianity thing that I've been proclaiming and preaching, that I've been telling everybody about, about the Son of God, about Jesus, is it going to make it or is it going to die here with me on this island? Is it going to break out of Rome? Is it going to make it across the world? I wonder, is this going to make it? I wonder if everything I did was in vain. I wonder if I watched all of my friends, the other disciples, die in vain. It would have been easy to sit on that island and wonder these thoughts. I wonder if it was worth it. Because I'm sitting here, rotting away, on an island by myself. But that's not what John did. That's not the attitude that John had. So we, we, we read in 1 John here. 1 John, he, he's writing. And what I love about this verse 
is how first person and how personal it is. See, John is giving this personal first person account. And he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. He's talking about the story of Jesus. He's talking about the coming of Christ. He's talking about being called into a disciple. He's talking about Jesus and and the story of how he was born and how he was raised and how he became the Messiah and the miracles that he did. John is talking about the journey that he watched the world go on with Jesus as Jesus spent 33 years on the earth. And he says that from the beginning, which we have heard, he's heard it, which we have seen with our own eyes. John's saying, I saw it. I heard it and I saw it. And I'm not going to let negative wonder take that away from me. I heard Jesus. I saw Jesus. And then he says, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. He touched the miracles. He touched Jesus. His hands had touched Christ. So he says, this is what we proclaim concerning the word of life. Now he's going to tell us, this is what we proclaim. I, as a Christian, if you're not a Christian, a Christ follower, that, that's okay. You don't have to be to be in here. I hope you feel super relaxed and comfortable. But I want you to know that I, as a Christian, I identify with this. That because of what Jesus did, because of what John is talking about, we get to participate And what Jesus came for, the reason that he came for, so that we could have eternal life. See, Jesus died for my sins. But in order to die for my sins, he had to die to his kingship. Meaning, he left heaven and he came to earth as flesh and blood. He felt what we felt. He cried. He hurt. He was hungry. He was just like us. He was born into that. And John goes on to say this, The life appeared... We have seen it and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life. I proclaim to you the eternal life that I've seen and testify in Christ. Which is with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. So that you may also have fellowship with us. John is saying this is so good that I want you to participate in it with me. What kind of church would we be like? If I don't know if you've ever had um, like if you ever had like a dish or food, been out to dinner with a significant other and you ate something and it was just amazing and so good. But and, and you didn't give it to, you know, your significant other to try. You know, it's a, yesterday we had cookies um, at, at a Christmas lunch and and my wife cut them into fours. And when I ate a piece of one of them, I wanted all of them. I said, no, I want all of this to myself. But actually, I thought, man, my wife would love this, and Lifa would love this, and I'm glad that my wife cut them so that we can share. It's like, if something's so good, you want to share it with somebody. You want to tell them about your favorite restaurant. You want to tell them the best place to get a steak, and the fact that it's the husser, and the only husser that counts is the one in Seapoint. That's what you want to tell people. You want them to know that. What kind of church would we be like if we took all the good news that is Christ Jesus and we never told anybody? What kind of person or Christian would I be if I said, I I, I proclaim what Christ did in my life, but I never shared it with you? No, it's too good. I don't want to give you any of it. See, John's not, he's not that way. And he's challenging us as a church to not be that way. And he's saying, because I had it, I want you to fellowship in it. I want to share the fellowship with you. I want us to share the fellowship of Christ together. And so now, John goes on here and he says, And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We fellowship with God. And then in verse 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from Him. And we declare to you, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. God is light, And in him, there is no darkness at all. See, a light has shined in the darkness. And although this light has shined in the darkness, it's enough light to inform our faith. All right, so if your life, if the world is a dark place, a light, that is Jesus, has shined in that darkness. And it's enough to inform our faith, meaning Jesus gave me enough to put my faith in him but 
It's not so much as to remove all the mystery and all the wonder. See, we can wonder and believe at the same time. There's so many things about God that I wonder about. So many things. So many mysteries that I wonder. But it doesn't challenge whether or not I believe. See, it's okay to wonder. And my hope for you guys is that you wonder about the love of Jesus and how much Jesus loves you. As Mary wondered, as Joseph wondered, as Gabriel wondered, as John wondered, they all believed in this Savior that came for us. So now what I want to do is I'm going to read a passage for you out of Luke. And, and as I read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, they're going to put them on the screen so you can read along. And I want you to read along with wonder. Put yourself in Mary's shoes. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Imagine the fact that they just came from seeing an angel. And they've gone to, to Bethlehem because they, they've had to participate in a census. Rome wants to know who everyone is and where they are and what they're doing. And so Jesus is born. So I'm going to read this story to you here. And you guys can read along on the screens. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph, he also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom His favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things. Remember Mary and all that wonder. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. That's a sweet mom right there. The shepherds, they returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to bring the, the, the band on stage and we're going to sing O Holy Night one more time. And I just want you, as you sing this song, I want you to think about the wonder of Jesus. I want you to think about the wonder of what that moment was like when Mary gave birth and she treasured up that moment in her heart. See, that it was a special moment, a special time. See, what Jesus did for us on this day is a wonderful thing. And I hope that the rest of the day, you spend the day wondering in awe and wonder about what Jesus did for you. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you ignite in everyone in this room 